Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us for the first in our series of Calm COVID Combos. Each webinar convo will be on a different topic relevant for the COVID-19 impact on you, your business, your team, your finances, your wealth, and so forth. The idea is to take all the stress, hype, and drama out of the conversation and just have a calm combo on what you need to know and what's important that you need to do in your business to get you ready for the bottom of the dip so that when we get to the other side, we're ready to go again. For those of you who don't know me, my name is John Knight. I'm the Managing Director and Founder of Business Depot. I'm an accountant, but I also spend more and more of my time these days as a mentor and advisor um, to businesses of all different shapes and sizes, leaning upon my experiences and my gray hairs to help people um, get unstuck from whatever it is that's holding them back in their business. Joining me today is Rebecca Mahalik. Rebecca is our Director of Business Depot Sydney, also the head of our national advisory offering. Welcome, Rebecca. Hi, John, how are you? Yeah, good, good. Hi, everybody. Um, as John mentioned, I'm the Director of Business Depot um, from the Sydney location. I'm also the head of the national offering for Tech Advisory. Um, which has actually managed to put me in a bit of a unique situation. We've been able to do some really great things with our clients in getting them into the cloud really quickly or supporting them through that process um, over the last couple of years. Uh, it, it's where I spend most of my time in accounting now, but also counselling through our clients through in, a, in very much an advisory sense across all of their finances. So they understand their forecasts, where they're going and are across the good, the bad, and the ugly scenario. And um, for some people right now, we're in the ugly scenario and we want to make sure that we're all here together at the end of it. Exactly. And that's why we need to have these calm combos about um, what's going on because there is a bit of hype out there and there is a bit of, I suppose, fear. It's, it's justified hype because there is some fear out there. So let's hopefully today take some of the fear away and help you understand your position and because if we can help you understand your position and what your entitlements will be, um, then that will help you put a plan in place for your business. So today's focus is going to be on the stimulus and support packages um, from the government, both federal, state, and also some of the assistance packages announced um, from the banks and those types of things. Um, we thought that was probably the most important one to get started with, um, but we're then gonna do a whole series of these. So the idea being that and we're gonna dive into each topic that is relevant for this situation that we're in. So on Monday, we've got our next Calm COVID Convo with Rebecca and myself will be facilitating it, but we'll also have Anna Chipperfield um, who provides HR, people and culture services out of Business Depot. Um, and the idea is to answer some of those HR type questions um, along the way. But guys, let's get into it. We've got a whole list of questions that have already been sent to us. We've got a list of questions that we'd already wanted to make sure we addressed for you out there. Please add any questions you have to the Q&A button down the bottom, please. And we will, um, if we don't answer them on the way through, we will definitely come back to them at the end. So please continue to do that. But I, I wanna start by asking you, Rebecca, what's been the number one question that clients have been asking you about the stimulus and support packages that are out there? The number one question that um, I've been having around that stimulus package, uh, well, all of the stimulus packages is, how much cash am I going to get? And particularly the naming of some of the packages that have come out is uh, a little bit misleading, putting that word cash in there. And um, while some people will get some physical money, a lot of people won't. And there is um, a little bit of uh, uncertainty around how those packages are actually working particularly the federal um, packages in relation to PAYG. So, so what, how do you see it, Rebecca? Is there going to actually be cash paid into their bank account? There, there might be for a very limited number of Australian businesses. What's primarily going to occur is businesses will get a PAYG credit in their activity statements um, for this financial year, up to $50,000. And whatever they claim this financial year, they will get the same amount next financial year, so long as they're still lodging activity statements. These amounts are not going to be cash, uh, at least not initially. They will be paid um, at a set time after lodgement of your BAS into your ATO account. It will sit there as a credit. It will offset 
um, your debts on the uh, activity statement that you just lodged potentially also any old debts that you've got sitting on there, that's still a little bit unclear. Because that's and a real area of conjecture, isn't it, Rebecca? That's you right. Because the ATO is coming out almost daily with changes to the information as to how they're going to administer this. And a couple of days ago, they, they put the line up there that a credit you get for this, this cash boost amount, can be offset against other amounts in the same activity statement. So if you're lodging a March activity statement with GST liability on it, the credit you get for this PAYG withholding could be offset against, or will be offset against that GST in that March period. What we that's don't right. know is whether it's also applied into any other existing debts. Yeah, that's not been made clear at the moment. And uh, so what you might find is some people will have existing debts and if they are in a refundable position that could go against the existing debts, or it could be refunded to them into their bank accounts. That will not happen automatically. It will be a manual process. Either the business or their accountants will need to go and request the money if it's available. And that's, and that's the big if. Yeah, and again, this information is getting updated daily. So we're, everyone's sort of flying by the seat of their pants to provide reliable information. And I'll just continually redirect you to our core blog on this on our website, where we'll be updating it as extra information becomes available. Rebecca, you also talked there about the two payments, because there's a lot of talk in all the media and everything about minimum of 20, maximum of 100. But can you explain just again how that potentially is split over what periods? Uh, no problem. So there, there's actually two, there was multiple payments and it all depends on whether you're a monthly or a quarterly um, lodger for your activity statements. But the entitlement that you have is split very um, definitively in financial years. So you will get a minimum of $10,000 if you are eligible this, based on your lodgements this financial year. So that's the quarters ended March and June or all the months that are involved in there. And that payment will also max out at 50,000 and that's based on your PAYG. So once your PAYG hits in those periods, 50,000, you don't get any more credits and that's for this financial year. And just to be clear on that, when you're talking PAYG, that's the tax you withhold from people's wages. Correct. Um, not the other PAYG. That's right. Should I bring up um, the examples on our blog, Rebecca, and, and we might talk through those to give people um, some, some information, I suppose, to, to really digest um, how these payment systems might work. Um, so here's our blog on here, which we'll be constantly updating with things. But this main provision, this minimum 20 up to $100,000 um, payment that you get, let's just jump straight to the examples. So the example I've got on the screen there at the moment, um, assuming everybody can see that okay, I'll just make that a little bit smaller, sorry. So what we've got here is we've got an example of someone who pays their PAYG withholding on a monthly basis, and they pay $16,667 or more. The significance of that number is that that is one third of $50,000. So what happens is you'll now go and lodge your March Bass. That will show on it PAYG withholding of $16,667 in this scenario. So when you lodge that, the tax office is effectively working out the first payment by timesing that by three. So the idea of that is that's then reflective of a full three month period being January, February, March. So if, we, if you're showing $16,667, the payment you would get on lodge, or the credit you would get on the lodgement of your bass would be a, a credit of $50,000, which is also the maximum that you can get um, in just this Just to make, period. sorry to cut you off, John, but just to make it really clear that that three times is only applicable to monthly lodges. Yes, yeah, really important. So because you've already maxed out your entitlement for this period, when you then lodge your April monthly IAS and your May IAS, you will get no further credit because you've already maxed out. And so any PAYG withholding you've still deducted from your wages will still be payable on those activity statements. Because you've then, because you've received the maximum of $50,000 in that first period, you are automatically entitled to another $50,000 in the September quarter 
provided you continue to remain active. Now, our, our interpretation of that at the moment is that you're still trading um, and you're still lodging activity statements. How they will remit that $50,000 is they'll remit that in four instalments. So basically the $50,000 will be split into four instalments and that will be paid to you um, on, or credited to you on each of those activity statements. Okay, so that's probably a bigger remitter. That scenario is probably for a bigger remitter to understand how that will work. The slightly different scenario is if you're still a monthly, uh, you're still a monthly withholder, but let's say you only pay $10,000 a month on your PAYG withholding. So again, that's the amount you've deducted from your employee's wages. In this situation, you'll now lodge your quarter bass, your March bass, you will get three thousand three times the ten thousand dollars, which you which you show on your on your on your bass. Um, but because you haven't maxed out your entitlement yet, you'll get another ten thousand dollar credit when you prepare your April IAS, and another ten thousand when you get your May IAS. And so at that point, then you've maxed out your entitlement for the period. Because you've received the maximum of fifty thousand dollars, you will also still then get a quarter of that every month for the next four months, um, spread out into, um, into October. So hopefully that gives a little bit more clarity for those as a monthly remitter. I'm just gonna quickly run through a, a smaller payer as well. So this is someone who remits PAYG withholding on a quarterly basis. So these are only small businesses where they probably pay about um, $2,000 per month in PAYG withholding. So you've got fairly small amount of wages in this situation. But just to run through, so because you don't lodge it monthly, $2,000 a month on your March bass, you will be showing an amount of three times, um, you'll be showing an amount on that bass, I actually think there's a typo, oh no, that's the minimum. So because you're less than the minimum amount, when you lodge that bass, you will get a $10,000 minimum payment for that period. Um, you'll then lodge your June bass, which will also show another $6,000 worth of PAYG withholding. You've already, so 6,000 and 6,000 is 12. You've already received 10, therefore the difference you would get on lodgement of that one is another $2,000 credit, which brings you up to 100% of the PAYG remitted over the two quarters. Because you, in that situation, got a $12,000 boost, you will then get $6,000, but instead of spreading it out over four periods, you'll get it over two periods, one on lodgement of your June bass. So you actually get $8,000 on lodgement of your June bass, because those two amounts get added together. And then your September bass, you'll get an extra $6,000. I know there's a lot in that, and there's a lot to digest, um, but um, have a look at our blog. Um, on the website, it'll be the top blog on the website um, and we'll have different scenarios we'll put in there. If you have any questions, happy for you to, to reach out to us on that. Um, Rebecca, has there been any questions sort of pop up um, from our attendees yet that are relevant to that? I've answered a couple of them already. They were just some quick specific ones. Um, we do have a couple of general questions that maybe we should go through. And I just want to actually, I can see some things going on in the chat. It's actually a little bit difficult for us to monitor the chat and respond to you. So just a little reminder, if you do have a question, pop it in the Q&A box instead so that we can see them. Yeah, there's a good question on there from Julia, which we might just quickly address now. Julia said, if we need to request a payment extension for the March bass, are the, are, are the ATO still granting this with the $50,000 credit? Um, Rebecca, you got a view on that? Um, I have a personal view, which is that they should absolutely still give you the credit. They haven't provided any clarity at this point in time. There's um, around that, I believe. I haven't seen anything that's Yeah, I don't believe there's a requirement that your March bass is paid. Um, I no, added some... The requirements to actually get paid is that you're lodging basses and that you've been or that you've lodged a bass or or an activity statement since first of July 2018. So you've been active in the last couple of years, and um, and or you've lodged your 2019 tax return. And that's an or you like the lodgement date for the 2019 tax returns hasn't come up yet. So we understand lots of people haven't, but it's one of those two things is actually what makes you eligible to receive the money and there's no comment anywhere around payment extensions 
So my assumption is going to be we're still going to be able to get payment exempt, ex, uh, extensions for clients, still be able to do payment arrangements and you'll still get your credits. Yeah. So I just want to emphasize that because it's quite relevant for some newer businesses that have only started this year. So one of the criteria is that you've, you've, you've lodged a 2019 tax return, which shows you are a business, or you've lodged some activity statements since 1 July, which show you are a business. If you've started business on the 1st of January, it means you've got no historical lodgements. Um, so unfortunately, under the current rules, you miss out um, on the cash boost. Now, I don't actually think that is the intention of what they are trying to do here. So maybe, fingers crossed, maybe there'll be some changes to that to widen the net to enable um, the newer businesses to access this um, as well. Okay, um, let's just have a, a quick look um, at some of the other requirements. Oh, sorry, Rebecca, have you got anything else to add on the cash boost um, amounts at this stage? No, I think we've covered them off. That's the information that we have and it, it gets clearer every day. I think that we're all quite a bit comfortable around what the amounts are that people are going to be entitled to. There's still a little bit of grey area around exactly who's going to, particularly the new businesses, but we'll just keep everybody updated as we know. Yeah, and uh, I suppose one more thing I will I will add is, and it was one of the questions that was submitted in advance, how do we maximise the amount we get at this point? We've got that um, online as well now. Yeah, so everyone wants to maximise their entitlement. We need it in business, don't we? Um, but the ATO has come out literally in the last couple of days to clarify their position on this. So most tax legislation has what we call anti-avoidance provisions within it, which basically mean don't do something specifically to get a tax benefit. Um, they have come out on the ATO website and they've basically said, if you do something that is out of the ordinary, specifically to get a tax benefit, then you will get no entitlement is basically the position that they've taken. So I know there's been a lot of people sort of thinking about how do they bulk up their wages in March. Um, I, I have to counsel against that because there's a risk that you will then get none of the cash boost um, amounts as well. Um, as a result of doing something like that. There's another trick in there. There's another party, I suppose, that misses out on this cash boost. And these are those self-employed people. Maybe they just trade as a sole trader or a trust um, that, that don't actually take wages and don't have other employees. So if you're somebody who goes through an entity or, or, or declares income as a business, but you only get drawings or, or distributions, um, from a tax perspective, that unfortunately the way the legislation is drafted at the moment, you would not have an entitlement to the cash boost. And again, I don't think that's the intention. Um, it's probably just a little bit of a quirk with how they've structured it. Um, and I'm actually fingers crossed hoping that there's something else that comes out to support those people. That's okay. right. Okay, so that it's actually crossing off quite a few of the questions that we've been asked, but there are just um, a couple more that I might run through really quickly now. Yeah, we've go been for it. Asked, um, again, just, just to clarify that um, the ATO will not be paying you money into your accounts, at least not immediately. It will only occur if overall you have a... Um, if overall you have an actual credit and then you or your accountant log onto the portal and request that to be refunded. That will occur 14 days usually after the request. So it's not going to be, it's not going to be quick. In that way, um, the, you know, that, that, that's my issue with the naming of the stimulus package. Um, being a cash boost is actually not really cash boost coming into your business. It's more like cash flow not going out of your business. There is a question from Maria in the chat as well, saying that she thought the government was only providing 50% of the PAYG. That was increased in the last announcement to 100% of PAYG. That's right. And um, we've got another one here from Anita. What if your quarterly PAYG is less than 5,000? Will you still get the minimum 10,000? You will get the minimum 10,000. Yeah. And that is one of the scenarios where depending on what your GST amount is for that quarter, you may actually get some cash back. So if your PAYG is 5,000 and your GST is three, you might get that two, which is the difference. 
Yeah, that really ties into one of the questions that was submitted beforehand as well by, by Jen. And Jen has a, um, a construction connected um, business. Um, let's say there's an admin person in there and a couple of tradies that sort of help out on, on the tools. Um, they can't afford to, potentially can't afford to keep that administration person on, but they're really um, hesitant to layer off if it means that they no longer get access to this cash boost. The, real, the, the answer to that question really lies in what is your total PAYG withholding that you do every month or every quarter if you're a small business? It actually doesn't change your minimum entitlement. So if your monthly amount means you still just get the minimum entitlement, then it doesn't make a difference whether you've still got that employee on the books or not. If, however, it increases the entitlement, it'll only increase it by the tax taken out of that person's wages once you get past the $10,000 minimum. Um, but happy to, to um, take that one offline, Jen, and speak a little bit more specifically about it as well. Okay. Um, I might just jump back to the blog just for a bit of completeness to make sure we're covering off on some of the other stimulus that's available as well. One of the things that, um, I'll skip down here, one of the things that's actually not getting a lot of airtime, and it doesn't need a lot of airtime, but it's important to note, is that they have given some temporary relief to directors and businesses around distressed businesses. So one of the biggest things you, know, you hear accountants talk about is insolvent trading and asset protection. So this is gonna be a massive test to all this advice we've given around asset protection over the years. But what they've actually done is they've reduced some of the, or they've increased some of the thresholds where a business or a director can be pursued for insolvent trading and some bankruptcy rules and those types of things. Just wanted to specifically mention that one. Um, the other one that gets a bit of airtime is the government offering to guarantee up to 50% of an unsecured loan that you get through the bank. So the way this will work is the bank, the loan facility will still be provided by the bank, but because it's an unsecured facility, i.e. it doesn't have a charge against your company or um, a mortgage over a property, then the government will take some of the risk out of it for the banks so that they can give you a cheaper interest rate by guaranteeing 50% of the loan. So these loans are to be a maximum of $250,000. The loan term will be three years. There's no repayments, interest or principal in the first six months, um, and they'll be otherwise unsecured. I think most of the banks are coming out now with their packages around this. Have you seen many of the packages that have come out yet, Rebecca? Yeah, I've kind of had a bit of a look at all of the, well, the major banks' websites anyway, and I've spoken to um, some reps at Commonwealth, Westpac and ANZ, and um, the general feeling with all these guys is actually that they're still really unclear themselves exactly how they're going to roll this out. Um, they, and the, uh, the, one of the bankers that I spoke to actually suggested to not go down this path. If the business could actually get an act, a real loan that's not backed by the government. And the reason why he suggested that is these actually have much shorter terms than their normal business loans. So yeah. even once you get through that six month period, the repayments will be high in that last two and a half period. And yeah. Yeah. I was talking to a broker yesterday, Rebecca, and they talked about a potential interest rate, I think of about 5.5% still, which is low for an unsecured loan, but obviously higher if you actually can provide real property as security. That's right. And there's still a 50% unsecured portion. So there's still quite a, a big um, hit there. And what's probably also not clear to people is that with these loans, although they're not secured by bricks and mortar, the banks are still going to require you to sign off um, a director's responsibility over them as well. So you'll still be personally liable for them, just not actually putting a registration over your house. Yeah, so we've got to watch the space with the banks with these particular loans that are 50% guaranteed by the government. Um, I know the different states have some different um, assistance packages as well. In Queensland, they've announced 10-year um, loans that they will make to people um, for up to $250,000 as well. They are interest free, I think off the top of my head for 12 months or maybe it's six months. Um, and, I, and there's a two and a half percent interest rate after that. So I'm gonna, I, I dare say more people are gonna be more interested in that loan through the Queensland government than potentially going through the bank. But of course there is a third option to just access any, any security that you do have available. That, um, I mean, that option made me upset for the first time that I, don't work out of the Brisbane office and I'm in the Sydney office, John. That was one of the best 
releases that I've actually seen through this whole entire um, event. Yeah, it was good to see. And we'll talk about payroll tax shortly as well. Um, just to cover off some of the other um, key initiatives, um, early access to superannuation. So to be eligible for this, so what they're talking about is they're talking about $10,000 up to 30 June 2020 and potentially an extra $10,000 um, in the following financial year. So the 2020-2021 financial year. The eligibility of this is more targeted at the individuals, obviously. Um, so it needs to be someone who's unemployed, been made redundant, or had their hours, or if they're a sole trader or self-employed, had their income reduced by 20% or more. Um, so if you meet those criteria, and of course, if you're eligible for, these are ors in here, by the way, if you're eligible for some government payments. So uh, this is one thing that I'm talking about a lot with some of those independent contractors that you might use within your business or some of those small sole traders out there. So if your income drops by 20%, um, you can access $10,000 out of your super to get you through the, the dip over the next little period. Um, it's not something, you know, I think um, many people are going to be encouraging you to take money out of super. And of course, we can't give financial advice on that as accountants. Um, but if you need it, it's a resource um, that potentially is available to you. Um, you got anything to add to that one, Rebecca? No, um, probably just uh, just to echo your thoughts around whether or not, um, just be really sure that this is your only alternative. Taking money out of super um, early is never something I'm really excited about. As we all age a little bit more, there's going to be less and less pension for us. So as much money as you can keep in super, but I understand absolutely that some people won't have yeah. a choice in this space. So much harder to get it in these days, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Um, if there's anyone on the on the webinar, um, a self-funded retiree, they've basically just given you more flexibility as to how much you take out. Um, something I'm struggling to get too excited about is an increase in the instant asset write-off. So previously you could buy an asset. So this is a depreciable asset. It's not buying um, a building. It's like buying chairs, computers, equipment, manufacturing equipment, those types of things. You used to be able to get 100% deduction up to $30,000. Up until 30 June, you can now spend up to $150,000 and get a 100% deduction. I just emphasize there, um, all this does is matches your tax deduction to the cash flow or to the commitment. Don't, I can't get too excited by it because most people I'm talking to is we're tightening up our spending rather than wanting to go out there. But if you've got equipment finance, for example, uh, maybe a chattel mortgage, um, and you spend up to $150,000, you should be able to get 100% deduction up to $150,000 worth of value, even though your finance may be pushed down the line. Do you share my non-excitement non there, Rebecca? I am so not excited about that, but I also have just a quick word of warning that although the limit is 150,000 for the deduction, when we're talking about motor vehicles, you still need to consider the luxury car limit. So you Good will point. not be able to claim the whole cost of a new Maserati. It's not gonna happen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, have you been asked that question? I have actually yeah. twice. <laughs> Opportunity. Well, and, um, I can't remember <laughs> what the other one was, but yes, it's interesting. There's also some accelerated depreciation rules, which I'm, I'm struggling to get excited about as well um, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, they've already given us the instant asset write off for 150,000 up to 30 June anyway. So we'd have to spend more than 150 grand before 30 June for this to even kick in. Um, and then next year, it'll go back to the $30,000 based on the current rules. And all it means is if you spend 100 grand, you'll get an immediate deduction for $50,000 and you still keep the, the remaining $50,000 depreciated under the, under the rules. Again, all that's doing is aligning tax a bit more with cash flow. There are some opportunities for wage subsidies for apprentices and trainees. Struggling to get too excited about that as well, to be honest. Yeah, you would have had to have already had those people working with you from the 1st of January. Yeah, so that's a hard one to, to sort of look at at the moment. Um, and if there's any, if you've got any clients or any of your employees, it's probably useful to know the different payments that are allowable to them. So um, they've increased the ability for people to go to Centrelink and get some income support. They've doubled that to about 1100 a fortnight now. Um, and there's also a once-off payment of $750 before June, or I think it'll come out in April actually, um, and a second lot in July as well. Um, but one of the big ones um, is the administrative support concessions from the ATO. Do you want to talk to us about that a little bit, Rebecca? 
Yeah, so we did actually touch on parts of this a little bit before, but um, one of the reasons why I'm quite confident that we're going to be able to get those um, refunds of PAYG if they're applicable, even if you don't pay your BAS, is because the ATO has allowed for a four-month deferral on tax payments. So that's PAYG instalments, BASs, um, monthly activity statements, tax returns, FBT, pretty much anything you have to pay the ATO. If you need to, you can have a um, deferral of four months up to the payment date. At this point in time, I haven't seen any of that roll out automatically, but they might start blanket putting that out and you'll see the revised amounts in your portal as the March BASs and other yeah, loads in I think the key thing there is we should expect the ATO to be very cooperative, shouldn't we? Um, and then I know, you know most deferral requests um, have been accepted. Mm -hmm. I think the important thing to note though, although you might there might not be any um, interest charges on any deferred amount, you still are required to lodge and you okay. still should talk to the tax office in advance that you want the deferral um, of certain payments. And as always, penalties from the ATO generally only apply for late lodgement. Um, it, and it's much harder to get a late lodgement penalty remitted than an interest charge. So absolutely still try to do this on time as much as possible. Yep. If we jump into quickly some of the state stuff, I won't go into the detail, but it's all on our blog. But in Queensland, they are going to basically refund you two months of payroll tax that you've previously paid if you're in payroll tax territory and they won't make you pay for another three months. So basically that actually gives a little bit of money back um, and gives you another three months to not have to pay payroll tax. They then will allow you to defer all your payroll tax for the rest of the calendar year um, into 2021. So that's actually quite a good concession, I believe. And then of course, there's a $250,000 um, low interest loans um, that I talked about before. Um, I believe New South Wales has got some concessions on payroll tax as well, Rebecca. Um, yes, so we've got um, some concessions for monthly lodges still need to lodge the next three months. So that will be uh, the March lodgement next week. So March, April, May, but you will not have to make payment of those three lodgements. When you're, if you're an annual payer and when you're doing your annual reconciliation for payroll tax, they'll calculate out your total payroll tax for the year and you'll get a 25% discount. Um, so that's just giving everybody um, a little bit of a break there with payroll tax in New South Wales. Plus from the 1st of July, our threshold increase to a million dollars is being brought forward a year. That was already going to happen, but not till yep. next year. So yep. they've brought it forward. Again, this is one of the things I don't get that excited about because in reality, it's a $5,000 saving. So yeah. yes, it's great that it's $5,000, but it's really, it's only $5,000 too in, in the scheme of things sometimes. Um, um, if, you, if you're from sorry, Victoria, oh, sorry, there's something else, Rebecca? Uh, yeah, uh, there are some fees that are being waived as well by the New South Wales government. These are going to apply specifically for um, the harder hit industry, so hospitality and um, the trades. So if you are paying any state-based fees or licenses or anything like that, they're going to be waiving those fees. Great, great. If you're from Victoria, check out our blog. There's some detailed information on there. Or, of course, call one of our directors down in Sydney, either Paul or Andrew. would be happy to answer any questions you've got in there. In Melbourne, John. In Melbourne. Sorry, what did I say? Sydney. Mm, okay. Coronavirus. Um, You'll also see on our blog some of the other content that's going out, some of the other tips and so forth. Yeah, we've got a content on there specifically for real estate businesses. Um, we've got some webinars that have previously been recorded up there for you to see, some stuff about fuel tax credits, what to do in your workplace, um, what the banks are proposing as well. Um, they're basically allowing everyone to have a repayment holiday for six months. Um, most banks are allowing us to push that out, but you do have to apply for that. Um, so that won't be automatic. You do have to um, talk to your bank about that. But I think you, you will find um, that they've been pretty generous with um, their assessments of that. They're being pretty generous with the assessment, but you still need to have your information up to date. You still need to be able to provide them things like your tax portals and what's been going on in the business and recent lodgements. They are going to ask these things. And please don't forget that most of these banks are still going to charge you interest during this period. So don't just do it because it's a nice to have actually need it. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, maybe let's just have a quick look at some of the questions on there. Um, yeah. 
Terry's got a question. What if you withhold different amounts of tax for your employees each, each month due to them working varying hours? What will happen there, Terry? It's actually your March BAS or March activity statement that will determine how much you get. So um, it's all gonna come down to that one month that will determine how much you get in that situation. So it, it'll depend whether or not she gets the full 50 then. So it'll be the combination of March and June, True. potentially. Yep. So it's all going to depend. And although you're not a very consistent payer, that should be actually be consistent in your history of lodgement. So there's not going to be a risk that it looks like you're um, fiddling with things. Yeah. And particularly if you are doing the right thing and lodging through single touch payroll, they would have seen those lodgements happen right up to the point that the announcement was made on the 12th of March. Yeah, yeah. So it's all, that, all that's really going to do is whether you get 10 grand or 50 grand. If you're only going to get the minimum entitlement anyway, won't make a difference what you show on your March Bass. But if you're between 10 and 50, what you do actually show on your March Bass will be, will be very relevant. Um, quick comment for Jason Holmes, who made a, a question, a, a comment on the chat there. Thank you for noticing my sign in the background, Jason. Um, and I'll have a go at Brandon as for why he's avoiding getting a coffee. Um, any more questions on there you think we, need, we can quickly answer? Um, question from Samantha about annual GST registration holders that started their business before 31 December. Um, that's actually a good question, Samantha, and I haven't, um, haven't had that question put to me yet. Um, given the way it's structured, I don't know how it would even um, measure that, to be honest. What, I, what I'd probably mention here is that's in regard to annual GST and these stimulus payments are being made to businesses that have employees. Even if they don't withhold PAYG, you've got to have that payroll process. So I suppose you'll be eligible if you had um, a payroll event occur before the 12th of March or an entitlement or an ability to actually prove that. If you haven't made any lodgements in regards to those sort of items by the 12th of March, you will not get a payment automatically. And I don't think there's any clarity at this point in time around a manual process to apply for payment for those people that are potentially um, outside the box or could fall through the cracks. But we will keep trying to find that out. And once we get in that position, I know I personally will be calling up the ATA to find out what, what we've got to do. Yeah. Um, Andrew Hughes has just put a question on there as well, which I just want to reinforce um, this. The minimum payment is $20,000, but it's spread 10K in April and 10K in the September quarter as well. So just to reemphasize that, we've heard a lot about the 10 to 50. That's because that's the first payment. If you get the first payment, you also get the second payment provided you remain an active business. Um, Brittany, the awesome Brittany has got a question on there as well. Just wanting to confirm that this is for all small businesses and that there is no requirement to prove your income has been impacted by COVID-19. That is correct. The only real requirement to get the cash boost amount, which is driven off your PAYG withholding, is that you are an employer and you deduct tax um, from wages. Yeah, a couple of other little ones in there, like you've previously been active, um, but you don't need to show that your income's dropped to get the cash boost. The income dropped um, sort of only really kicks in if you want to access your super or you want to start to go to Centrelink to get some, um, to get some benefits in that regard. Uh, just having a quick look through here. We've got a question from Peter Riley about the criteria declared purpose for accessing the loan. I think we covered off on that a little bit. Again, um, it's going to, the, applying for those loans is actually going to be determined by your lender, not necessarily the government. They've made it much easier for the banks to lend you the money. The requirements will still come down to your individual banks. And although they don't um, need to be as stringent on checking the loans, they still will be. Yeah. It has to be for business purposes though, doesn't it, Rebecca? It does. Yeah, right. so it does need to be for business purposes. So, so in addition to some of the um, the eligibility criteria, yeah, it, it, the idea is to encourage um, businesses to be to be surviving the storm um, and to be investing in their in their business. We've got a couple of questions here about people who aren't currently withholding. Um, if you're not currently withholding from people, but you are registered for payroll and are lodging a figure at W one and paying superannuation if it's accruing 
or making your STP lodgements or including that um, those figures when you're doing tax returns, then you should be able to get a payment. That That's what my understanding is. If you're taking money out and it's not being reported at that W1 figure really anywhere ever, that's going to be much harder to be able to get a payment. And I have not a huge amount of confidence around that at this stage. Yeah. Maria's got a good question on there, which is a bit of a common one. Um, we, we have a business and both my husband and I work in it. I'm assuming that you've got no other employees, uh, Maria. Um, sales have stopped, calls have stopped, which means our income has stopped. The business is run as a company as trustee. Are we, still, are we able to still receive help as individuals? Yes, unfortunately, because you don't have employees and you can't get the cash boost amount, you'll still be able to go um, and get early access or quick access, apparently, to the job seeker payment. Um, because you're self-employed, they'll be looking at a drop in your income to get access to that. Um, there was also a question on there from Janine. Does the double Centrelink payment to $1,100 apply for pensioners as well? No, there's a list, not that I'm aware of anyway, there's a list on our website. So the way they've doubled that is they've inserted a coronavirus supplement payment. So it's not a permanent increase, um, even though it has the effect of doubling it. To be eligible, it's job seeker. Youth allowance, job seeker, parenting payments, farm household allowance, um, and then there are some special benefit recipients. I'd have to go into the detail to see whether that's age pension, but I'm not. I don't think it is. Are you aware, Rebecca? No, my understanding was it wouldn't be applied to um, people receiving the age pension. Yeah, um, and it, but you would get access to the seven hundred and fifty dollar amount, which comes out soon. That's right. I've just had a question here on what does W1 stand for? Sorry about that. I get a bit caught up in my accounting lingo sometimes. W1 is the gross wages. So when if you're filling out your own BAS, there's actually a label there that says W1 and that's where, say, if you were taking out $1,000 for your wages but not withholding, you would put the $1,000 in that box but no figure on the withholding amount. And... Um, uh, and the withholding amount's normally W2. Another great question on here from Karen. Um, Karen, a concerned employer, employer by the sounds of things, where she knows that one of her employees is paid over $70,000, but her husband's lost his job. Is there any assistance available to her? Unfortunately, the only assistance is really then to go to Centrelink and get the job seeker allowance for him. In doing that, they have waived the asset test um, the asset means test for accessing the benefits, but unfortunately there's still an income test. So her income will still be taken into account for determining whether them as, they as a family are able to get access um, to any of those benefits. Probably the best thing there is probably to think about if she really needs it to access some of her superannuation or his, some, some of his superannuation. There's a question on here for Marie Dean that I don't believe we've answered in regards to a client that's lodged their December BAS with GST only, um, but they will be having PAYG on March. Um, it might be one that won't get the payment straight away, or if it does get the payment will be reviewed, but it will be something that we might have to attend to um, individually with the ATO because you've had a history before the December BAS of PAYG, you've got a higher chance of this actually happening, but it's a high chance that they will review the scenario. So make sure that you've got all your documentation, calculations for that payments, and the reason why. Again, if you're lodging these things through single touch payroll, you should be okay. Yeah. Um, Maria's got a question on there. How do we claim the Queensland stimulus um, for the refund of the payroll tax? Um, so the payroll tax, Queensland Government now, that you can apply online. Um, it is something you have to opt into to request the refund and to get the deferral um, and the waiving of the payroll tax. So you can, um, you can jump on the Queensland Government website to start that process. Okay, great. I've um, um, got a question here from Tracy around about um, going into debt arrangements to utilize the offset and the BAS funds as capital to keep the BAS open. Um, look, that, that's a planning strategy. Again, the ATO will potentially be charging interest on those loans. We don't know, but they're very willingly putting them in. Most of the interest will likely be remitted if it is going to um, be charged. 
as opposed to getting into a debt arrangement for the BAS. There is the BAS extension for four months generally, which is probably a better option starting from that March BAS because it is an extension of payment for four months instead of actually um, putting in a payment plan. So there won't be interest on the extension. Yep. yep. Tom's got a super question on there. He's already got 25,000 put aside to put into super to get a tax deduction this year. Um, he's wondering whether he can put the 25,000 in as a tax deduction and then still withdraw the $10,000. Um, I, I haven't looked into it, Tom, but I can't see why not. They're two separate um, rules. Um, and obviously the tax deduction would be, would be relevant for you only if you've got other income in that year that you can, you can offset that against. Yeah, and the 10,000, not forgetting that you have to actually be um, be eligible to be able to take that 10,000 and meet the other criteria in that scenario. Okay, so I think we've answered most of the questions on there. We've got a lot on there. So sorry if we've, if we've missed yours. There is one about Western Australia. Unfortunately, we haven't had time to dig into the Western Australia stimulus package yet. Um, but um, you know, we endeavour to update all the states to have that on our blog um, in the next little while. Want to make sure, Rebecca, we've covered off on the other questions that when we send the invite out, um, we were going to make sure we addressed um, the 100K. Will I actually get a payment? Um, what can I expect? I think we've covered off on that. And again, I'll redirect you to our website as more information comes to light. Independent contractors is one that I've mentioned before um, that's a little bit tricky and that because they're a business in their own right, but unlikely to have too many employees, um, they can be a bit tricky to get access to the, well, they won't get access to the boost. I need to think about other ways. Um, how, do we, how do you see the government loan support? We've talked about that. We've talked about the payroll tax. So Rebecca, oh, there were the other questions submitted beforehand. Um, I think we've actually covered off on most of them to be completely honest. I think so. There, um, because of the ambiguity of some of the information that we've received so far um, or that was announced by the government, there have been those consistent questions. Um, but there are a couple here and there that are outside the box. We're happy to take more um, questions later. Contact us directly through the website, email um, anybody in the team or call, and we will, as much as humanly possible, answer you and get back to you as quickly as possible. Yeah, so guys, hopefully we've answered most of your questions there. Um, by all means, reach out, as Rebecca said. Um, maybe just to wrap this up, Rebecca, um, what would be the number one tip you're giving to your clients at the moment, um, whether it's tax or stimulus payment related or not, the, the number one thing that you're saying to clients at the moment to get them through this blip um, and making sure they come through the other side ready for when the, when the economy comes back. There's actually probably two things. Um, I said one. No. Uh, <laughs> stay, stay, stay across what's going on in your business and have a really, really clear picture. If you, um, and things aren't really bad for you right now, but they could get bad, just know what your trigger points are to have to access additional funding and do it well in advance. Um, because it will take time to sort out and make sure whether or not it's in regards to getting a cash boost or going for a loan, get all your paperwork sorted. We don't know, we know that they will look at cash boost payments they're, they're a little bit out of the ordinary um, we don't know to what extent they're going to do that when they're going to do it um, the penalties will be will be harsh so if you think you are outside the box and your normal lodgement for those March basses or April basses or any of them keep your paperwork yeah great I did notice one more question in there from Susie um, who's asked whether the credit is automatically applied yes it does so the credit you're entitled to for the cash boost amount Will automatically be applied in that activity statement or automatically calculated. You don't need to do anything to trigger that assessment for you. Um, guys, thank you so much um, for coming along and, and attending our webinar today. I mean, ultimately, we just want to help you guys get through this um, and continue to be successful businesses into the future. As I said at the beginning, this type of crisis is not like one we've seen before. It's affecting much more, many more industries than have previously been affected by GFCs and, and those types of things. We've got medicos, we've got surgeons who have had their income, which is just cut straight away. We've got businesses that have actually been closed down and not had income um, from one day to the next. So this is deeper 
and wider as to who is being impacted by that, which is why there is so much uncertainty around how long the economic impact will impact our businesses. Because no one is immune, um, in my view, unfortunately, at this point in time, because even if you have demand for your services, um, your customers ultimately have to be able to pay for it still. So I asked you before, Rebecca, what your number one tip is. My number one tip for you guys out there is that now is the time to shine as a leader. Um, don't bury your head in the sand. Um, we abs you absolutely must be aware and across your numbers. You can't bury your head in the sand on your liabilities. You can't bury your head in the sand as to what benefits are allowed for you out there. You can't bury your head in the sand with regards to your tax obligations or bank obligations or anything like that. But let's not forget, it's also a human crisis and we have to be aware of the humans within our business and as the leaders of those businesses, we need to make sure that we're helping them get through this as well. There will be emotional stress, there'll be financial stress, and now more than ever, we need to understand how your team are thinking so that when they are going through this, we can help them as the leaders to come out the other side positively and ready to go whenever you're ready to press the go button. So that would be my parting tip for you. Don't forget you're the leader here. Don't forget the humans and don't bury your head in the sand. Guys, once again, thank you, Rebecca, for joining me. Thank you, John. We're going to do a whole series of our calm COVID convos. That was pretty calm, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah. Um, the next one we have on Monday is going to be focused on people and culture. So we're going to cover off on a few of the HR sort of issues. Not sure we'll be able to ev answer every um, legal HR issue, but we might even see if we can get a HR lawyer on that conversation. Um, with us as well. So you can register for that at, on the website, businessdepot.com.au. As I've said, um, by all means, keep an eye on our blog. Um, and on our blog, you'll be able to um, get all the updates as they come available. So um, I've just put that up on the screen. So a short version of the, um, the website address for you to get straight to that blog. If you just go bit.ly bit forward slash BD COVID updates, and we will continue to update that for you. Um, and as I said before, if you're interested in the People and Culture webinar, jump on there, register for that one. That one's on Monday. Um, we'll make sure we've got this time clear as in time zones. Apologies for that, those um, who logged on a bit early. We then will be planning a third one, which is going to be actually focused on brand and marketing um, through a crisis like this. So once again, thank you for joining us. Um, if we haven't got to your question, um, we apologize for that. Um, please reach out and we'll be happy to guide you as much as we possibly can. Thank you, everybody. Bye.